Um, this is the first uh, plenary session. Um, so, Michelle Hooper is the tournament director for Rugby World Cup 2021, the women's edition of World Rugby's showcase event set to be staged in Auckland and Whangarei in October, November 2022. Of course, delayed due to COVID-19. With over 20 years experience delivering major international sporting events, both in New Zealand and overseas, for the likes of World Rugby, FIFA, ITU and the America's Cup, her current mission is to create and deliver a unique celebration and festival to supercharge women's rugby globally, right here in New Zealand, Kiwi style. Welcome, Michelle. It's going to be not to kick that over between now and the next 40 minutes. <laughs> um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko rangitoto te mawanga, te waitamata, te moana, no waiheki motu waho. Ko Ro Rob Tapper roa, ko Annabelle Guthrie oku matua, ko Michelle Hooper toku ingawa. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Michelle Hooper, Tournament Director of Rugby World Cup 2021, now playing in 2022. And yes, that's our official uh, event title and brand mark. Um, it's an honour to have the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon. And thank you Mark Gosling, Chair of the Evans um, Conference, or Evans Group, uh, for inviting me to, to come along and speak. And Michael, um, thank you for letting me share this with the VMA as well. It's a great honour to be here. I'd also just like to do a little shout out to our venues that are here, obviously Northland Event Centre. I've seen Karina and uh, Gemma this, this afternoon. Woo! Northland, whangarei. Um, Waitakere Stadium's another one of our amazing venues for Rugby World Cup. Thank you, Mark and the team from Waitakere Stadium. And Eden Park, I've seen China this afternoon. I haven't seen Nick Sautner, but another fabulous venue that we're going to be hosting our matches at in 2022. Um, Great, so just a little moment on the uh, logo there. You're looking at the, um, as uh, Mark alluded to, we've just recently been postponed 2022. So as part of that, we said to work, um, World Rugby, it's an imperative that we have our brand mark in Te Reo Māori, and can you please ensure that whatever comes out and whatever we relaunch, we have our brand mark in Te Reo Māori. So we didn't have that before, so uh, obviously today's session is about opportunities through adversity, and I really want to acknowledge and celebrate the fact that we now have that for um, the next 18 months and to celebrate our event and what Te Reo means to New Zealand and Aotearoa. So um, that's just a little one before we change the slides. So supercharging the women's game globally. So New Zealand won the right to host Rugby World Cup uh, back in 2018, and it was a hard fought battle. There were six other nations that were bidding for this right to host this amazing event. Um, it came down to the wire between Australia and New Zealand, and of course the New Zealanders won. Um, the other contenders were France, England, Wales, Portugal, uh, and you know, ourselves in Australia. So it was a hard fought battle. And what we won at odd was a bid to supercharge the women's game. I'm going to delve into a little bit more what supercharging actually means for a bit of perspective. Um, but we felt that, you know, New Zealand, when people bring rugby to New Zealand, um, Rugby World Cups, we infuse the love, the aroha into the game. And World Rugby recognised that women's rugby needed some aroha in order to supercharge it and take it to the next level where it rightly belongs. So today's session, I thought the thing that when I was asked, you know, what, what to speak, what would be useful, or, and, and one of the things that I've really had to focus on a lot, as we all have, is what are the opportunities through adversity? What are the, um, there's been so much kind of hardship and worrisome times and uncertainty, but, um, you know, how do we look at, uh, you know, what, what it is that is an opportunity? And I think I've had an incredible um, career in professional sport. Um, I got that opportunity th here in New Zealand when New Zealand uh, won the America's Cup in, back in 1995 and a 16-year-old sang the America's Cup um, parade and was inspired by Sir Peter Blake and his mission back then. Predominantly working in men's sport events and incredible, you know, opportunity and you know, well-paid career um, career path. And you know, I've, I've never really seen myself as being, um, you know, not on an even playing field as men, which has been very fortuitous for me. But I know that's not the situation for a lot of women. So, uh, what I this is the fourth Rugby World Cup that I, I've been involved in, and it's the first one I've ever been involved in in delivering women's sport. 
So the last event I worked on was the Rugby World Cup in Japan in 2019, and I spent two years going back and forward uh, to Japan from, from New Zealand uh, to help, firstly, World Rugby solve a problem that they were having up there with the organising committee. Uh, and then I started working for the local organising committee, so employed by the Japanese Rugby Union, and uh, to supercharge, well, to supercharge, to just deliver the tournament up there for them. Um, through that experience, I absolutely thrived on working with the Japanese. I loved their, their culture, I loved their, how they were as people, they're so respectful, they were very professional, they were very um, the, uh, proper in the way that they dealt with, the, with business. I can't say they were speedy, they certainly weren't speedy, there was certainly a lot of discussion and debate every time you needed to do something, but we worked out a way to work together to achieve the results we needed to achieve. But one of the things while I was up there and seeing the amount of money that they were hemorrhaging to deliver Rugby World Cup 2019 was how incredibly fortunate we are when we deliver events here in New Zealand. Because we always deliver events on an absolute shoestring, there's never any fat in anyone's budgets. But the reason we can and the reason we can infuse so much incredible um, energy into our events is through the spirit of collaboration. So one of the things that stuck with me when I was doing that up there in 2019 was I could not wait to come back to New Zealand and deliver an event here in New Zealand, um, working with all of our key stakeholders again. Having done it in 2011 for the Men's Rugby World Cup, I know the power of, of um, collaboration and working together through our local councils, through our venues, through the volunteers, through our workforce staff. There's almost so much goodwill. And I think being with, in rugby and in the rugby community, there's also so much commitment to seeing things succeed. So, um, you know, that was one of the things I thought was incredible. So I'm going to skip through. The I'm not going to get there very fast if we... Here we go. Aotearoa, New Zealand. Our small group of islands lies in a vast ocean that connects us with our Pacific neighbours and all nations of the world. It was by following the swells and waves on this ocean that Māori navigators first landed upon our shores. Waves can travel vast distances and gather immense power. Every wave a guide and navigator for those who came before, every current a way forward or a way back home. The vitality and connectivity of water is at the heart of the identity for Rugby World Cup 2021. Bringing people together, sharing and spreading the passion, power and energy of the women's game. Like the most powerful waves, Rugby World Cup New Zealand 2021 is an unstoppable energy, connecting the world across all the great oceans. Naru Nui Naru Roa, He tai mihi tangata. Our logo is inspired by the Naru, a symbol of the ocean's waves, energy and connectivity. Simple, purposeful and anchored in the movement that brings us together for this great game. Regardless of colour, creed or hemisphere, it is the game that unites us. He wai hiriri, he wai ripu ripu, he wai honuna. Rugby World Cup New Zealand 2021 will pulsate with an unforgettable energy. At the core of the design are the North and South Islands. Within the expanding ripples are traditional symbols representing the mountains, positivity and potential as well as waves representing growth and energy. Created to come to life in motion, adapt and integrate. Let us amplify and grow the game together. Show the very best of women's rugby. Inspire the next generation both on and off the pitch. Embrace those who call it a lifeblood and those who will and connect like never before to celebrate the unlimited and unstoppable energy of this game. New Zealanders invite the world to join us next year in September for Rugby World Cup 2021. playing in 2022. Sorry, <laughs> clearly we haven't updated that video yet. We are still in the throes of uh, resetting everything following the postponement. 
Um, over the next 20 minutes, I just want to provide you with a bit of perspective about what supercharging the tournament in 2021, 20, um, now in 2022, means to us, um, and looking at what 2017 was like in order to understand what supercharging means for us. Um, I want to talk about the opportunities from adversity. Uh, there's just a few of them. There are so many of them that we're, that we're focused on, but um, these are just a few examples that I've brought for today's session. Um, look at some case studies of those um, opportunities and uh, recap what leading change involves from my perspective and how I see that, what that means. And at the end, I'll just summarise some of the growth um, avenues for the women's rugby um, over the next 18 months as well. So I think just as important, my, my role as tournament director is to ensure that the major international tournament is, a, is highly successful. I work for New Zealand Rugby, my, my primary role is just to deliver the tournament and we have a whole team working on um, supercharging the women's game and growth of the game here in New Zealand which focus on that on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Oh. Sorry, I skipped over here. One moment. So this is just uh, in terms of scene setting, so this is what the tournament looks like um, now. So women's edition of Rugby World Cup, 8th of uh, October to the 12th of November are the new dates. It's the first time this tournament's ever been held in the Southern Hemisphere. 12 participating teams, nine of whom have qualified already and three that are yet to qualify. Three match venues, as I've already mentioned. Ten match days, which have a pool phase, quarterfinals, semifinals and the finals, and a bronze final. Played on the same day, the bronze final and the final. 26 matches in total, five rest days between each match. That's relatively new, so as part of the postponement, World Rugby came out with their new decision to have five days rest between each, um, each game, which is brilliant for us because it means all of our games can be played on a Saturday and a Sunday. It also means that we'll only have three matches a day instead of six, and that our games in Auckland can be played on one day and the games in um, Whangarei can be played on, a, on the Sunday, which is great because it means somebody could actually get to every single game of the tournament, and hopefully some of you in this room. All matches are Saturday and Sunday, and then Black Ferns are the incumbent world champions, five times Rugby World Cup winning champions. This will be the first time that the Black Ferns get to host, uh, to defend their title on home soil. I won't dwell on this too much, but for the avid fans, you can also get this off our website, the match schedule, but it shows you uh, which venues host which games. Um, and one of the things you'll see there is obviously that opening match day at Eden Park. Um, that's a, a, the, the model for this tournament is based off capacity stadiums of 5,000 people. Uh, that's what the World Rugby um, bid to host document stated, that the stadiums needed to be of 5,000 capacity, and that's so stadiums don't look empty on TV. Um, however, you know, in order to supercharge, that was one of the first things we wanted to, um, to you know, take on, and that is that we want to fill that stadium for the opening match day at Eden Park. And you'll hear a lot of that um, over the next 18 months of how we plan to do that and ensuring that we do do that. Because if we're committed to supporting women's sport the way we support men's sport, that's not going to be a problem for us to do that for the Black Ferns. So, perspective. So I'm just going to go through now quickly what um, it looked like in 2017. So this was held in um, Ireland. So they hosted the tournament on, um, and I think the evolution of women's rugby and for world rugby is just on this ginormous um, trajectory. Uh, and often, you know, year on year, what you see developing um, it creates such a, a momentum shift for, uh, for tournaments and events. And in some ways it's an opportunity, sometimes it's also, it can be a, a little bit of a conundrum, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Teams were accommodated in University Hall of Residences in um, Ireland. They had a three-day turnaround between match matches. Five matches, um, five match days for the tournament, where we've got ten. Twelve teams, two host cities, Dublin and Belfast, four match venues, but only three of oh, one of those was actually a stadium. The three others were club facilities. Um, the peak TV viewership was at 3.2 million um, people for uh, France versus England semi-final and 45 million views across the, all tournament platforms. Um, and the final attracted 17,000 spectators. So when we talk about it, you know, that opening match day and one of our ambitious goals is to sell that out. And if we do that, we'll be making world rugby history for women's rugby. So you can see why it's such an important driver for us if we're gonna supercharge this tournament, that we put that statement up front for our tournament. I think it's really important to note with women's rugby and having worked in the men's game for so long and understanding you know, the psyche that the teams come into that tournament with. Um, and one of the attractions for me when, in taking this role was the opportunity to really take the women's game to the next level and create a Rugby World Cup that the women can be as equally proud of as the men are in their, in their tournament. 
that I think it's a, a bit of a misconception that women always want the same as what men have or want, and that uh, you know women want what women want, and it has to work for them and the female athletes. And one of the things that I found really endearing about this role and, the, and women's rugby players and the teams once you get get around them is their real warmth that they, you know, the caring nature towards each other and um, the sense of celebration when they get together. Um, it's, it's incredible and it's a really different vibe to being around the, the men's teams. Um, so in terms of what we do to supercharge the game and how we, how we um, show that back to them, it's creating a tournament that women enjoy and feel like emulates what, what's important to them. So I think the um, the warmth and camaraderie with women's game, sense of celebration, and they have you know one of the things is that they share team hotels, but they actually enjoy sharing team hotels. They don't want to all be in separate hotels. That's part of what they enjoy. So this is some beautiful photos from Dublin. And this is my favourite photo. It was obviously the Black Ferns winning their fifth Rugby World Cup title. Well, I'm sure we'll all um, enjoy that one. <laughs> So in terms of um, how do we supercharge, it's important to remember our focus is on supercharging the tournament, so this event for all of for world rugby and the sport of women's rugby globally. So what we did was we first of all look at, you know, what does great look like? So what is it that we think is really important for this tournament and then how are we going to go and achieve that? So at the end of um, 20, November 2022, when we look back, we say we would have delivered a high performance training environment that enables all teams to excel. Because we've got to remember they come here to compete and perform on the world stage, which means great training venues, fabulous hotels, um, easy transport um, solutions, uh, catering that's you know, next level, all of those little details which add up to an incredible performance for those teams. It goes without saying that we have to deliver an operationally excellent tournament. Um, we're very fortunate that we have only three venues. Uh, you know, in previous World Cups, there's 12 or 13 venues. So having only three means we can do a really good job of ensuring those standards across all venues are as, as similar as they can be. Ensuring that we provide hotel accommodation for all the teams, which is locked and loaded and progressing very well. Hosting that opening match day at Eden Park in front of capacity crowd, as I've talked about already and making Rugby World Cup history for women's rugby on match day one. So that's one of the big statements we're putting out there because we want New Zealanders to be as committed to that as we are. Securing commercial revenue target for the commercial um, and commercial partners. So one of the key things with women's sport is that it has to um, be able to pay for itself. It needs to be able to stand on its own two legs. So part of this journey is ensuring that those commercial pathways are there too. So we want to ensure that we sell out all of our um, commercial spots uh, for the tournament to show that the commercial model is there um, as well. And the appetite we see from the commercial sector is incredible. They're super passionate about women's sport. They want to see change. They want to see diversity and inclusion. And I, you know, it's one of the things I don't worry about is that we, I'm confident we're going to sell out all of our commercial spots for this tournament. Um, we want to develop and deliver an in-venue Maori and Pacifica Community Festival entertainment um, program alongside this tournament. That was one of our ambitious goals, although there was no money to do that. Um, but we've, I'll talk about that more in more detail shortly. But obviously, uh, Pacifica Maori communities are integral to the women's game of rugby, and this is their home. This is their home tournament as well, and we want to make sure that's equally well represented in, in Rugby World Cup 2021 delivered in 2022. We're striving to achieve uh, carbon neutral event status and we want to sell 100,000 tickets to this tournament. And we've come up with a really compelling tournament sustainability strategy thanks to a number of people in this room. So what are these opportunities through adversity? So we're now going to have a little look at what that means. So when we talk about adversity, uh, there's, the, I guess, the, the things that everybody are aware of. Obviously, the global pandemic. For us, it was also the fact we had no Black Ferns matches in 2020 and reduced, reduced number of matches in 2021. So last year, we were meant to have eight home Black Ferns matches. And I'm sure uh, none of you will have realised that um, up until November last year, New Zealand rugby had never sold a single ticket to a women's rugby game. So in, in hosting, bidding to host this Rugby World Cup, there was no proven ability to sell tickets to women's rugby. So they, were, they had built up this campaign series for the Black Ferns at Home to help drive interest, create momentum and prove that the um, ticketing model for this tournament would actually work. So fortunately last year in November we had a great test event out at Waitakere Stadium and we proved that we do, can sell tickets standalone to women's rugby and a fantastic triple header match day out there which proved to be an excellent test event for us although we, could, it wasn't, we didn't have the full bells and whistles we were able to test a number of things and ultimately sell tickets to a women's rugby game. 
uh, government announcement of the climate change emergency. So although that doesn't, it seems adversity, I'll talk to, talk to you a minute about how we turn that into an opportunity. The tournament postponement to 2022, and again, obviously that happened, but what it's given us is an amazing lead time to do such a better job. Three Women's World Cups in two years and the IWG Summit. So that doesn't sound like an adverse situation, but actually accumulating from the bid being won in 2018, then these three incredible Women's World Cups um, and us having a relatively small um, shoestring budget to deliver this tournament on, it really put a lot of emphasis on why this needs to be so successful and how we need to collaborate in order to achieve what we're striving to. Because you know we've got the cricket in um, March, April of 2022, FIFA hot on our heels in 2023, and us in that October and November window. So it's it's imperative that um, you know we can create an event that will stack up against these other events who have much bigger budgets than ours. Um, and obviously the requirement to rebrand the tournament. So what are some of the opportunities? And I won't talk to all of these, but just in terms of what, what what's come out of that and this evolutionary journey now between, um, you know, starting, and I started the role in February last year, and then one month later the global pandemic struck. So, you know, it's been all on since then. Firstly, with trying to get the teams even into the country for the tournament to take place this year, which was then, you know, um, postponed and, and given us this great win rate of 2022. So we wanted to, the opportunity to make the world breaking, um, record breaking history for the women's game on match day one. Uh, so we obviously talked about that relocation of the match to Eden Park and we cut, taken, you know, bidden off to, to try and achieve that big goal. Funding to develop the In Venue Community Festival Entertainment Programme. So we've, we've secured funding in um, this time frame to be able to now deliver that, which is really exciting. Um, and we can deliver an enhanced volunteer programme involving more New Zealanders. Um, we collaborated with Downer, who are a New Zealand rugby partner, and we hope that we may get them on in the future for our tournament as well, to develop a tournament sustainability strategy, and, and the ability for that now to supercharge us as well. Uh, the consort resource consent approval for Eden Park, which is obviously a big change that's occurred in that time. Not sure how many people were at the 660 concert, but that certainly motivated me and inspired me to keep going with our role and, and truck on, even though it's been a really difficult time. That's what we all do events for, that feeling, that buzz, that, that opportunity, that historical moment. And I was very inspired by um, what Eden Park were able to achieve with that. Uh, there were five rest days between matches and separating out those match days so we only have three per game, which is, it makes a huge difference to the broadcast arrangements for this tournament. Uh, I talked about that we'd be able to have that test event at Waitakere Stadium. The inclusion of Tereo Māori and revised tournament branding, which is really important to all of us. Greater lead time to secure commercial revenue targets and collaborate with partners. Uh, and obviously work on cross-promotional opportunities between the three World Cups and also the international um, working group, the IWG Summit. An increased runway to connect with the community, which is at the end of the day going to be the most powerful driver for us in, in achieving what we need to for Rugby World Cup 2021. Sorry if you feel like I'm racing, but I said to myself, I've got less than one minute per slide if I'm going to get through it in 40 minutes. So <laughs> probably put too much in this. So in terms of the case studies, so when thinking about adversity, my preferred approach is, you know, what are the opportunities that this brings? It is perceived as a negative, but how can we use this to our advantage? And in this section, we look at a couple of examples of this um, and how it lets us amplify with a bit more time. So one of the uh, parts of you know, delivering events on the world stage, but when you come home to New Zealand, and one of the things which resonates with the majority of people that come here, and I think Michael touched on it when he first said about the, how we treat, treat you know, how Maori culture is embedded in the importance of what we do as New Zealanders. Weaving uh, meaning into our purpose has always been something that's really important um, for this event, and with more time we can assure we do a better job of that. Uh, we have such a unique connection between our people and our land and nothing sums that up more beautifully than Maori culture and um, the language and, and um, the protocols. So I'm looking at weaving meaning into our purpose. Um, we've worked closely with our, and you would have seen it in some of how that brand mark was created in that first video, um, but we call it the Hini Moana uh, narrative for the tournament. So na o i fa i he ao Futiporo, which means the four currents of the world converge and let rugby be the channel. So we are connected to the whole world by the ocean. 
and all of the teams and all of the people that travel to New Zealand will come here some way, shape or form across the ocean or by water. Not many will come by water, um, but across the water. Um, and that this is uh, the kind of founding connection of us to, um, to this tournament. We talk about unstoppable energy for this tournament. It's a hashtag of, of Rugby World Cup and their women's rugby, unstoppable energy. And when you think about the momentum of water and shifting currents and, and that convergence of water here in New Zealand, um, that underpins everything that we do. Uh, we talk about the, it being the um, Hinemoana Kai Whenua, the consumer of the land and the torrent, so always cutting away and never giving up and relentlessly attacking, trying to, to break free the water against the land. And you think about the pursuit of women on the world stage for sport, you know, relentlessly trying to get to their objective and, and be seen on the world stage in an, in, in an equal fashion. So everything about the Hinemoana narrative is, um, is, is imperative to us as a tournament, and it's um, what we emulate with what we do with the teams and the planning and with world rugby and how we want our tournament, it'll also be embodied when you get to the tournament time as well. And Rugby World Cup and Futiporo, which is rugby, is the, is the vehicle for doing that. So the festival, this is very exciting because uh, obviously if you haven't already picked up that our games match days are going to be triple header match days. So I'm not sure how many of you watch triple header 15 aside games in a row at one venue. Put your hands up if anyone's watched that. <laughs> so it's an endurance event. So we know that we need to ensure that it's a hybrid between sevens um, and one of my colleagues in the event sector says it's a hybrid between warriors, sevens and um, the best of 15s. So that's obviously the experience we need to deliver at, at, at match day and there's no more beautiful thing, a way to do that then through this, the, the cultural festival of showcasing Maori and Pacifica culture um, and entertainment because we all know that they have an incredible ability to entertain. So the festival vision for the tournament is to weave cultural entertainment program into the tournament that celebrates, empowers and engages Maori and Pacifica communities, people in place. And we've set up a um, festival coordination group which includes a lot of our key stakeholders to contribute to that uh, and how we bring those groups together and identify them for the tournament. And I'm pleased to say that the um, Maori All Blacks match at uh, Mount Smart, which is happening shortly, we're collaborating with Auckland Unlimited who are going to help provide some Pacific elements to the tournament to showcase a little bit of what we think we'll be delivering at tournament time for Rugby World Cup 2021, a little bit of a test there as well. So to develop the um, festival vision, we secured the funding to bring it to life um, and Maori and Pacifica communities, the huge role and place they have in supercharging the women's game globally. And I think it's important to note uh, how many Pacific Island athletes actually play in all of the international teams globally for women's rugby. Um, and that will be on show and showcased here in New Zealand. At the moment we have Fiji uh, have qualified. Uh, Samoa have the opportunity to qualify um, in the um, final qualification winner tournament, which will probably be January. Um, but otherwise, um, obviously, that we also have the Black Ferns. So just in terms of what that entertainment means, so there's things like the headline acts, uh, the out of field and pre-tournament entertainment program, um, the communications on field, what we do around the ground in terms of um, commentary, anthems and calls to field, etc. Um, and then obviously the vision, um, greater layers of, of this can be um, overlaid across the tournament um, as we get closer to the tournament. So the next case study is looking at sustainability. Uh, so obviously this is a, the one of the out of the climate change emergency. Uh, it's a it's a really great driver for us to connect with the corporate sector around sustainability. And uh, we did a collaboration with Down, as I mentioned, uh, in January to create a tournament sustainability plan. So Down are obviously specialised in the construction industry, but sustainability is a core pillar of what they do. Uh, they've never done it for a major international tournament, so they were very excited to have the chance to do this. And we had 20 of our key stakeholders in the room. We had a full day workshop. Um, um, to get the best out of everybody and all their ideas in one place. We based it off the UN Sustainability Goals, so there's 17 United Nations Sustainability Goals, and uh, from, the, from the day we worked out which are the ones that are most relevant to our tournament, um, then we also, in the afternoon, we had a session on what are the opportunities, what, are the, what is it that we can work on to um, be more sustainable or, or um, ensure we can get that carbon neutral status, and developed a, a opportunities matrix of what we were going to work on uh, as the tournament and also with our key stakeholders. So this was a little bit of the outcome in a, in a high level um, overview of what that, what that looks like. Um, so the 17 United Nations goals, and you can see them, they're probably a little bit hard to see up on the screen, but number 13 is all around climate action, um, so consumption and climate. 
Uh, number 12 um, is the responsible consumption and protection. So both of those are under the Kaitiaki headline in Guardians. Uh, then we have Unuku, which is rainbow, and that's gender equality and reduced inequalities for people. Uh, the Haora, health and wellbeing, so um, number three, which is good health and wellbeing and the initiatives that fall under that. Um, we also talked about, so those are kind of our focus areas, but how are we going to do that? What are the enabling um, bodies for us? And so one, 17, the United Nations goal number 17, partnerships and goals. And number four, quality education. Uh, so that is all around um, how we as a tournament advocate for change, we create awareness, um, we work with our stakeholders to ensure they have sustainability plans and are working in this area, and um, doing everything that we can to work and collaborate together on the um, sustainability objectives which are important to all of us. And the fact that the Rugby World Cup is such a visual um, representation of New Zealand on the world stage that it's imperative if New Zealand has a climate um, change emergency situation scenario that we really stack up as well. So we see that as a great opportunity for us to help us with the commercial relationships too. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a show of like, so um, under the reduced inequality, so one of the initiatives that we have around this is um, inspiring our tamariki in a community uh, ticketing in initiative so that we can help get um, children that couldn't otherwise afford to come to the games to the games, and it will remove barriers such as cost of tickets, um, access to food and transport. Uh, so that's something that we've committed to doing and have put in our sponsorship proposals to our corporate sponsors is something that we'd like them to contribute to as well. Um, and the price point for this Rugby World Cup is um, so mind low blowingly affordable. Um, it's all yet to come out, but it, it, will, it means that we can make, hopefully make a good impact in this space. So that's just an example, I guess, of one of our sustainability objectives that we've come up with. And we have 45 on the register, and I'll let you know um, in maybe November next year how many of them we're actually able to deliver. So unconscious bias. So this is, a, this is a really interesting one, and I'm just going to share with you my story about unconscious bias. So um, obviously, as I said, in my career and was, um, you know, has been in men's sport. I um, grew up in a business, my dad's business was paintball war games, so I used to marshal men and running around in camo suits all the time and having to tell them to get off the field. So dealing with men and being bossy was never an issue for me. Um, and I hadn't worked in, in, woman, in women's sport before. And I had a thing probably about three or four months ago, and this word misogyny kept coming up, and I was like, I've got to look up what that means. So I looked up what misogyny meant and <laughs> unconscious bias, and it was this incredible moment for me. And I, you know, and because I hadn't been, it hasn't been clearly in my face or something that's affected me necessarily, I wasn't aware of it. But um, it was interesting because I've always grown up as a, one of three daughters, and um, my dad's, uh, you know, right hand helper and d loving building and making things. And I always just said, I was, I'm a tomboy, you know, I was, these are all the things that just tomboys do, and they love mountain biking and, you know, whatever. And, um, but then I realised that actually that I didn't need to be called, I was just a girl that likes doing all those things. It wasn't a matter of being a tomboy. Girls can do all of those things too. And it was this moment of, um, of realisation and having listened to this podcast about misogyny and unconscious bias. And it talks about those preconceived ideas about what things are or labels that we put on things. And the reason I'm sharing this is because we need to fill the stadium for women's rugby and have an incredible experience where these are the best athletes in the world. There shouldn't be a question of whether people will come or not. But we have these preconceived ideas that exist about you know, how we look at women's sport. And the other one that was for me, after I had this breakthrough and realisation about things that had occurred, and we don't know that that's how we've been programmed. These are things that exist there, and that's how we view things, um, but we don't really necessarily know the reason why. Or So the other one was for me was I've never been a massive netball watching fan. I played netball all my life, but I've never really watched it on television or followed it. And I thought, is that, was that attitude towards that a preconceived notion or that I've been told, oh, it's woman's sport, not interesting, you know, when they, they change the channel? So I was like, wow, oh, all of a sudden. And now that I'm aware of it, I'm much more conscious about not labelling things like tomboy or, um, you know, oh, that's such a geeky thing to do if you're into computers or just those little things that we can all make changes around because that's how we get real change. And this tournament is about making real change and filling our stadiums. So what I just wanted to do is we're working obviously really, really closely with the three other World Cups that are here in New Zealand. We're working really, really closely with the, um, the government and Sport New Zealand and all of the government agencies. 
And one of the things that we've talked about is the common element is this unconscious bias and how we make an impact on changing that. Um, because once people are aware of it, and my dad who's like 77, he, says, he often says to me, it's Michelle, it's just the way I was brought up. I don't know any different. You know, and he says the same things that he's always said, which really annoy all of us daughters. And uh, I was like, yeah, well, that's, that's that unconscious bias thing coming through in him. But now he's worked out to address it by saying, I know you're not going to be happy with me, but that's just what. <laughs> it's like, well, you can change it by just not saying it, Dad. So um, cult when we talk about creating a culture shift, you know, what is unconscious bias? How will understanding it act as a catalyst towards creating societal changes and attitudes towards women and girls? And what is the one thing you'll do differently with the awareness of unconscious bias? So I think if there's anything I leave you with today, it's to think, you know, is, is there an element of how you think or approach things that you might change and how you think or portray things in your day-to-day -day work? And I look at my daughter, I've got two sons and a daughter, and uh, my husband and I look at her and we think, she's a handful. And she is, like, can do anything. And, you know, and, and I think I, I'd never want her to think that she couldn't do anything, you know, or be anyone. At the moment, she wants to be a policewoman. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's really exciting. And you think I want her to think she can be whatever she wants to be, just like the boys do. So it's great. Well, they all do. So when we talk about um, culture shift, and then we talk about championing change. So what do these events have in common? The 1893 suffrage movement, women winning the right uh, for women to vote here in New Zealand. The ICC Women's Cricket Cup World Cup 2022, Rugby World Cup 2021 playing in 2022. The FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023. And the IWG World Conference on Women in Sport in 2022. So the common element is through collaboration, these events provide us with a platform to create a cultural shift in societal attitudes towards women and girls by creating awareness of unconscious bias, inspiring people to question their own preformed thought frameworks. And I'm just borrowing the hashtag from the IWG conference, which is change inspires change. So if we all do a little bit, hopefully we'll get that momentum shift we need to. Cool. So that's the unconscious bias case study. So moving on now, we've got a couple of cool legacy initiatives that we've got in the pipeline. Um, and this is led by an amazing me member of my team, Danika Charlton, who champions change in everything that she does, flat out a million miles an hour. So one of the brilliant um, legacies of this tournament is going to be the World Cup facilities upgrade. And I know a number of people, Mark, here is involved in a number of these. So uh, this was, uh, Danica, when I first started back in February, was campaigning left, right and centre. She had proposals going to that person and that person and this person. And she had all these different venues with different upgrade requirements. And she was farming them out to every kind of um, potential funder she could find, which was awesome and amazing. And she was, you know, trying to make sure that we could get these um, gender specific facilities for this tournament. And in a whirlwind part of this, um, you know, COVID um, upgrades, Sport New Zealand said they would fund the entire program um, to update these facilities in the lead up to Rugby World Cup 2021. So again, another incredible opportunity out of adversity. But also, Danica had done so much work in this field. She had all of the paperwork ready to go. She was ready when that opportunity arose. So, you know, it's never losing sight of what you actually want to get done. And then when that moment presents itself, you're ready to go. And absolutely she was. So these changing rooms and related infrastructure um, to create gender equal and inclusive fit for purpose environment for players and management. Provide Rugby World Cup teams with upgraded gender equal changing rooms at three match venues and eight training grounds that meet players and support staff satisfaction. So I think one of the things that's important here is that what are the barriers to women continuing in sport, women and girls? And, you know, it's been called out that our facilities are terrible for women. Um, you know, change facilities are not an environment that women feel like they want to go into. Uh, and that's important if you want to keep going in sport. So this is one of those projects which is, you know, what is the, what is the barrier and how do we solve that? So I'm hoping that um, what NEEKS has started with the help of Sport New Zealand and our awesome facilities is going to become a legacy for other venues to aspire to provide gender neutral facilities, which mean that there isn't a barrier there for people that, um, you know, really don't like those that, um, that, that changing room environment. There we go. The other fantastic one is championing Oceania. So again, Danica, very, very busy farming this out to every, anyone and everyone that will listen in terms of how we're going to get this baby funded. Um, so the idea is to supercharge 15 aside rugby for secondary school girls in Pacifica countries. So one of our um, pillars of the tournament was um, championing rugby in Oceania as well. And this has obviously been impacted by COVID, but we're hoping by the time the tournament comes back on stream um, next year, there'll be more um, borders open with the Pacific Islands. So the reason for this is empowering and growing leadership capability of Pacifica 
um, female game changers in each of the five countries. So they have somebody specifically trained and developed as leaders in those countries for women's rugby. New Zealand, these guys are supported by New Zealand-based Pacifica ambassadors that mentor these game changers and work with national sporting organisations in each country on 15-a-side frameworks for women. So this is already in operation and these people are already working together via Zoom. And um, it's led by those NSOs where they see the development um, being required and then hooking in with those Pacifica ambassadors to see what they need and how we can provide them with the adequate resources um, or leadership. Coaching leadership support from New Zealand and uh, Danica secured a great partnership with MFAT on this one. So MFAT are very motivated by these objectives and uh, we've managed to secure a great relationship with them on this. So what we're hoping at tournament time, well, five Pacifica secondary school girls teams will travel down to New Zealand uh, during Rugby World Cup for off-field and on-field upskilling, playing in the Pacifica tournament and to attend a Rugby World Cup match day. Um, and the increased time frame for us really enhances the ability to develop meaningful relationships and connection and hopefully get these schoolgirl teams to New Zealand, which was always the intention. Check my, oh, I think I'm over my time. Um, just uh, finally, I'm, I am getting into the summarising, but just really what leading change is, a, is about. Um, the key areas for leading change. So um, the key areas that I've identified really for us is just improving the experience for participating teams and championing future change to the host union agreement with World Rugby. So how we help them to create change long term. Championing collaboration with government agencies. Uh, and everything that we can do, working with them as much as possible to um, lead change as much as possible. Contributing to New Zealand's legacy for championing um, change for women globally through sport of rugby and major international event delivery. Advocating for and creating awareness of societal challenges that form part of our tournament sustainability plan, what great looks like for Rugby World Cup and the legacy this tournament will leave for future generations. What are some of the tools for leading change? vision for what great looks like for Rugby World Cup. So we have to know what we're trying to get to and once we know then we can attack it and drive it hard. Drive to truly supercharge Rugby World Cup for the women and girls um, in Oceania, New Zealand and Oceania. Being incredibly proactive, knowing that needs to be done and leading that change and focus on the detail to achieve great. Orchestrating the outcome through amplified collaboration uh, and efficiencies with key stakeholders, sponsors, suppliers and government agencies. If you have a vision, just keep going and keep talking to the people because eventually you can get there. Resilience, as we all know, our favourite word, continuously rising above the adversity, seeing and seizing opportunity to make a positive difference through sport um, on the global stage stage and I've added in there the hustle because it's easy to find reasons why not to do things. It requires a lot of hustle to keep looking and striving and driving change. Hustles like momentum which is like the currents of the water and the unstoppable energy that's needed to create change. So I'm just going to go through lastly the growth highlights for women's rugby in New Zealand. Um, some of the things you can come to expect. So 67% of New Zealanders love rugby, which is an awesome advantage for us. One in six players are now female in New Zealand. 13% year-on-year growth in women's rugby. 28% uh, year-on-year growth uh, in registered player numbers globally. 2.7 million uh, female players worldwide. Um, women's is, a, is the fastest growing game for world rugby in the world. 37% of women, 37% uh, in video views from the world's rugby audiences. So we achieve, women's rugby achieves 37% of, of those viewership of the, in the game. And there's 14,000 registered female players in New Zealand currently. So some of the cool things you can expect. So this year, I'm not sure if anyone saw that the Farah Palmer Cup games are all live on television um, this season, uh, which is going to be incredible for the game. And those are the sort of developments we need. We need to see a lot of females playing rugby on TV and we need to talk about a lot in the media. Uh, the inaugural Pac-4 competition, which is a world rugby competition uh, between New Zealand, Australia, Canada and USA. It was meant to be hosted in New Zealand this year for the first time. Um, it's more looking like it's going to be more um, regionally specific this year between the states and ourselves. But in 2022, um, it's, we're hoping that that Pac-4 competition, which is again, I said, the new competition, will be played here in New Zealand. Um, it's not confirmed, but we're hoping it will be. The inaugural Elite 15s Professional Rugby competition. So you would have seen the Blues and the Chiefs play a few weeks ago, the women's teams, and that was totally inspiring and motivating. We're hoping that that will be a full-time um, arrangement from 2022. There's been some cool other initiatives is that, that goes on and on, but I guess some really cool ones is the Akawahini Development Programme, which is focused on women leaders in rugby in New Zealand, not just in one specific skill set, but a broad skill set. 
and Rugby World Cup women's activators and working in community rugby throughout New Zealand. I've got one final video to play for you. here on our home soil, it's just unreal. Uh, not a lot of times our family gets watched and then to have the whole New Zealand backing us in our own country would just be fantastic. Having that fern on your chest, uh, you know, means a lot to me and my family and, you know, my country and my team. You get superpowers when you put it on, you know, you feel bigger, better, faster, stronger. And I still feel that today and I absolutely love it. Those girls have worked so bloody hard Three years of commitment, you know, to train early hours in the morning, to go to work and then to train again after work and just to spend, what, three hours or something with their families, you know, a day. That's commitment right there and really it's rugby and we love it. I don't think you need much more motivation than that to attend Rugby World Cup 2021 playing in 2022, do you? <laughs> Uh, just thinking about recent motivations and inspiration, and this was a quote from um, 660, but next time they tell you it's impossible, show them this, and that was the 660 concert at Eden Park, which just recently happened, making history again. So that's all from me. Uh, sorry it's taken a bit longer than I was probably allowed. Um, there's a few little things about what you can do next if you're highly motivated and, and keen to get involved. Um, there'll be a lot coming up this year, so just watch the space, Rugby World Cup 2021, hashtag us as much as you like. Thank you all very much for your time. <laughs>